I guess we have quite a few people here this evening. We're really excited. Um, I got to be the person to introduce this uh, man sitting next to me, who happens to be my husband. And uh, his name is Chef Yono Pernomo. We live in Albany, New York. We have a restaurant called Yono's, and we have for almost 38 years. And we feature um, dishes that are inspired by the Indonesian um, cuisine, the layered, you know, lovely, lovely flavors of coriander, ginger, lemongrass, coconut milk. Um, and you may be wondering, <laughs> obviously, I'm not Indonesian. And we kind of have a sappy story where my husband worked for Holland America, and we met on a cruise ship in 1976-ish. Um, in addition to running the restaurant together, we have been married for 43 years. And affectionately, we refer to Yono as the man, the myth, the legend. So now I will turn it over to him to talk a little bit about his country, his culture, his cuisine. And uh, then we have a, a cooking demo for you to watch. I hope you're not hungry, <laughs> because if you are, you will be even hungrier after you see this video. Thank you. Thank you for watching us today. Uh, I'd like to introduce a little bit about Indonesia. Indonesia is uh, the fourth largest country in the world after the United States. We have uh, 235 million population and we have more than 17,000 islands and we have uh, really more than 10,000 different cuisine because every province they have all cuisine could be 10 could be 20 so it's really truly uh, abundance for culinary uh, not a lot of people know yet about Indonesia but people know about Bali Bali is part of the one of our famous island where the populate with uh, probably only 5 million but again this we call the Paradise Island. It's 99% uh, people uh, Hindu or Buddha. And the rest of the population in Indonesia, 85% is Muslim. Also, I think the one of the biggest Muslim country in the world. Uh, talking about our cuisine, our cuisine is truly layer of flavor. It's different from Chinese, from Thailand or Vietnam, Dutch. So we are kind of a melting pot because everybody when it come to Indonesia back in 1600, everybody left the, uh, what's that? One of the cuisine. So now we have more than uh, influence from Arabic, China, of course, India, Spanish, Portuguese, Dutch, of course. So we have really kind of a very exotic uh, cuisine. Um, I just wanted to point out that I know a lot of people think that the Indonesian cuisine is all very hot, spicy, fiery. And certainly when Yono cooks for himself, there's always going to be a good amount of um, sambal put in there, but it, it, the, the flavors really can stand alone without a lot of heat to it. Um, and I think that there are only some of the provinces where, is it what, Padang? Padang. Padang. Or Sumatra. Where it's all, everything's gonna be hot? Most of them. Okay, and then there's a difference like what I think is hot and spicy and what he thinks is hot and spicy. <laughs> Two completely different things. Um, I know with the video there, he, he's going to show you an array of ingredients and there, there's some things that you really can't sub, but there are some things that if uh, ingredients are unavailable, which I, I don't think that you'll find that to be true, but feel free at the end of the uh, cooking demo to, you know, if you have a couple of questions about how this happens, or if you don't have this, what can you do or any other questions 
about the cuisine, about being in the restaurant business, about being married to each other and being in the restaurant business, about <laughs> meeting on a cruise ship, about an Italian girl and her values, and a man who comes from Indonesia. Um, you know, write those questions down and we will be happy to answer them. And it looks like we are just perfect timing to watch the cooking video. Enjoy. My name is Yono. Welcome to our kitchen. Indonesia is an archipelago. We have more than 17,000 island. We have more than 300 local languages and we have one of the most impressive collection of rempah-rempah. It means species of the island, king of the island. That's why everybody in the world come to Indonesia to get rempah-rempah. Indonesia cuisine is cuisine of flavor. And every island, every city, they have different culture, different cuisine, and different flavor. This is why we so uh, proud to be introduced Nusantara cuisine. This means variety of island in Indonesia. So, let's start it with cooking. The first time we put uh, all ingredients to make bumbu. Bumbu is when variety of spices or wet or dry, we make a paste, we call it bumbu. From that bumbu, we can create 10 different items. So for example, tonight we're going to make a gulai kambing, we use with the rack of lamb, and then the daging rendang, we use short rib. So the basic is bumbu, and then we just keep adding up, depend on kind of a, uh, cushion. For several uh, gulai, we just put a tambrik and more chili or less chili. So it's really your imagination. How much spices you put in? This is chili. Normally we use a uh, red chili. This is chili, so we call it chaberawit. This is a small bun bite. Candle nut, like a uh, kemiri, lemongrass. Gelanggal, turmeric, tamarind, lime leaf, curry leaf, curry leaf, this salad that we use every single cooking, it's garlic, ginger, this is fried salad, and this is palm sugar, and of course uh, coconut milk. This we can just make a paste, become sambal ulek. So for the bumbu, salad, garlic. Uh, Glanga lemongrass, ginger lime leaf, we ground together, put the blender, and we produce we call bumbu. So from this bumbu, we can create 10 or 15 different uh, uh, flavor and different cuisine, different name of the cuisine. So the chicken, pork, fish, and so on and so on. Bumbu is the key for the Indonesian cuisine. Now, after take you to the kitchen, we start to prepare gulai kambing. Gulai kambing is mean lamb curry. We use today's a rack of lamb, makes it easy to, because people love, American people especially love tenderness of the lamb. Put the oil in a hot pan. the dread of flour, salt, pepper, dread it a little bit, fry it. Cook like to rare to medium rare, depend on your desire. In the meantime, in the pan, I have to make a bumbu, the sauce. Bumbu that we've been grounded. So nice and crust. 
In the meantime, this, this side, I'll make a sauce already. I put the bumbu, that's the shallot garlic, lemongrass, ginger, gulangal. Then I put the curry and lime leaf. Thickening. And then we just put a little bit of salt. This is what we call the house passes. We put the coriander, cumin, and curry powder, and then there was a black pepper. A mango chani. This, uh, this truly is uh, influenced from India. It make tangy and uh, uh, sweet. And just cook it up, cook it up a little bit uh, until the thickening. Probably five to seven minutes. Just keep testing, uh, make sure uh, the flavor wash is uh, enough to taste like uh, salt or hardness. By CNN is a Dang and Dang is one of the best dish in the world, number one by CNN. So, how do you see this uh, same thing? Put the oil in the pan. We dread the, the meat. This one here, we can use three different ways. You cook this, sear it like probably five minutes. So really have nice crunch, crust outside.
Turn. Until the see the color. Okay, after five, ten minutes, after nice and brown, we pull out. And we put it open for 375 or 295 for three hours. Or, same pan, now we will make sauce. Three hours. Well, if you're going to slow cooking, but you know we can just cook it in the pot. Now, same thing, we just see the boom boom, and we're just adding up more stuff. Boom boom is really the key of the ancient cuisine. Then we put the sambal. Tamarind, concentrate. This kind of more sweet and tangy. Cook saute. Another. Then, you put the coconut milk again. Actually, you can put a little bit more. And then, you put the beef. Back, put back in the sauce. Goreng. 
Nasi min rice, goreng min stir fry. That everybody in the world has leftover rice for next days. It's like normally we use this in the morning. So what's happened? Nasi goreng come up. Is uh, mom always make lard rice, and then chicken, fish, whatever leftover. So the next day, he always make the leftover. Uh, stop become great dish we call nasi goreng. Well, today I'm gonna make a chicken, shrimp, pork belly, and this is the protein. So now I make high oil, a little bit, put the scallion, shallot, garlic. So, they are translucent, probably like two, three minutes. This one here is really, really, really awesome, awesome. And this is the key. This is a sauce. So, medium sweet sauce, fermented bean and palm sugar. Then we put egg. Put egg. Paragus, mushroom, anything you available. Cook a little bit. Uh, in the meantime, put the salt, pepper, and then cumin, coriander. Now I saute the chicken. With a couple minutes. You put a little bit of salt pepper every time you make, so build the flavor. Now, then put the pork belly. So everything that we cook nicely. Chicken almost done, and then put shrimp. Everything like a step by step. Let's build a nice spice. Now back, put the back. The just stir up. Then the rice. When you make fried rice, make sure you use the cold rice. See how thick they are. Just keep stir up. So now the shrimp just coming up, ready to go, not overcooked. The chicken just nice and tender, perfectly. 
Well, sometimes you have to test it. Actually, you have to test every time you serve. Mm. Voila, ready to go. Selamat makan. This is truly my, my dream come true. This kind of part. Everybody happy, the muscle, because muscle tender. why? Because we come with the food. Gula sauce. Food is created to make you comfortable, happiness, and with that food, I mean, everybody to eat. So truly, I'm blessed that I can share my culture cuisine to the world. This is gulai kambing. Gulai kambing is stew, kambing means go or lamb. It's very famous in our country. This is the rendang. The breast beef, so rib. Look at that. in the world. Thank you for coming to Yono Kitchen and I will see you in Indonesia. Also, you can stop by in our restaurant, Yono Restaurant, 25 Chapel Street, Albany, New York. Bravo! Kumbu is again, it's a variety of spices that we combine together to create this. So, we create to make you very easy at home, so you can just open the packet, follow the, uh, follow the uh, recipe, voila, in 20 minutes you have a great dish. Why have you to try the Indonesian cuisine because Indonesian cuisine is a have layer of flavor that no one has in the world. I create this bumbu from all the freshness ingredients in one packet. So you can try at home with no mass and fast. Enjoy it, cooking. Bon appetit. Selamat makan. Well, here we are again. I um, I hope that you enjoyed that. And I think the first thing is don't feel overwhelmed or that it has to take uh, you know, three or five hours to do something because chef is going to tell you, um, and then not that it's really a shortcut, but different methods of cooking. And the first question that we had was, since it takes three hours, any way to use a slow cooker or instant pot for goulet combing? Mm-hmm. Yep, you. Well, yes, uh, actually, the original in, in Padang, they make to six to seven hours steadily uh, stir up 
So can you imagine that when you cook seven to eight hours? Because today uh, we have a lot of uh, uh, equipment that we can use in our restaurant. We use a uh, you know auto sham like a uh, cook uh, very slow for twenty hours, and then we put sauce and we cut it up and we put it in the oven. Also, if you have a uh, uh, rice, but you got a rice cooker, slow cooker, rice cooker, just put exactly just a put the sauce. Crock pot is okay. Just put the sauce, put me, cover up, left, and then you can home. You'll get the rendang. Um, I think another thing what we call in the restaurant business is a la minute. You know, if you whatever and it, that the curry recipe, the goulet combing, you could do that with chicken, you know, make some chicken breast and just use that sauce with it. It's very interchangeable and it's not, well, this is a rigid, fast um, recipe. A lot of the sauces can be used with, you know, different things. And if you're vegetarian, curry sauce with coconut milk, with tofu oh, cool. or seitan is an amazing, an amazing thing. Okay, I'm going to try to keep up with this. Um, Oh, to, well, to make it easier, the chef said, I think one thing is that boom boom with all of the different, the lemongrass and, you know, back in the day they were using a mortar and pestle. You can do that in your, um, on a food processor and then just put a little oil on the top. You can keep that in the refrigerator for a really long time. So if you've got 25 minutes and you decide that you're hankering for really good Indonesian food, you just pull that out. You don't even have to have a wok. Um, you know, and we've got that big outfit in the kitchen, which works really well, but you can, you can use other. Oh, you can use anything really, you know, pot or, or pan or roasting pan or randu or whatever you, you have in home. Because again, cooking is not, cooking is art, it's not a science. So you can interchange. If I like this, use this. You don't like that, take it off, put something else. So it's really you know, what do you mean, what do you imagination and what you like? Yeah, and I think that that goes for a lot of things. People think that everything has to be really, really stringent, but, um, you know, if there are things that you enjoy and you want to put more in, go ahead and do it. If there's something eh, that didn't really work for me, um, experiment, but I, I'm telling you that the ingredient, that ketchup manis, which is the Indonesian sweet soy sauce, that if you're having a picnic, you want to barbecue stuff, you want to marinate it, it, it goes in just about anything. And I am serious when I tell you that when I'm doing pastry, if I'm making pecan pie, I might sneak a little ketchup manis into, uh, into that. You know, I've got some questions about, can we um, get a link to this recipe? Yeah, um, we have all three recipes and I, I will we'll definitely sort that out. And I know that you're all connected with Whova and all different kinds of things, but we will definitely make that available. Not for the faint of heart, you know, they're relatively long, but you, you can definitely take a shortcut and get a really good representation. And the, the nasi goreng is a quick one. Uh, bakmi goreng, which is the Indonesian noodles, also something that you can do in literally seven minutes. Yeah, seven minutes. And if that's about it, last call. Anyone have any other questions, comments, concerns? Um, if not, we are delighted that we could spend this time with you. You may have a couple of parting words. Well, if not, thank you very much for watching. And welcome to Indonesia sometime. Because truly, Indonesia is uh, one of the uh, great cities, especially when you love diving, mountain, ocean, uh, almost almost everything we have. And also, I think also we just uh, uh by Travel Magazine is uh, one of the best destinations in Bali, Ubud. We just have a new resource coming in, but I forgot the name. It's truly one of the kind of a resort. All right, so we, um, so far as travel is concerned, we have another question. If 
someone has never been to Indonesia mm -hmm. and they're planning a trip based on your experience, where's a good place to start and what would be the final stop? Well, depend up to how your adventure is. Normally you have to go to Jakarta because it's more capital where the action is and then Bali. Bali, Lombok, and you have more time, go to Sumatra, where the culture is totally uh, different as well. And then when you get more time, you go to Papua, which is Raja Ampat is one of the best destinations as well. We just opened up by our president uh, sometime two years ago. But again, wherever you go, you're gonna be have wonderful uh, food and wonderful panorama and wonderful people. Yeah, I've heard that a lot from anybody that goes to Indonesia, how much, um, how welcome that they felt and, and how much they love people and how happy people are to actually greet them. You know, there are some countries you go to, you know, people aren't so friendly, but um, in Indonesia, it's a, uh, it's a two thumbs up for sure. Um, oh, okay, well, that's all you. Oh, what are some of the most popular dishes to order from the restaurants? For us personally, we'll from, talk about From that. our restaurant, we, we call it a uh, Ristafel. Ristafel is, uh, the original is Prasmanan. Prasmanan in the olden day is where the king and queen have a reception, like a rice table. So in our restaurant, we divide by five courses, appetizer, and then we have a second course, third course, main course, and then dessert. So we can have people uh, enjoying it every dish. Instead, we put everything in front of you. And I think so in our restaurant, today is bakmi goreng, uh, rendang, Oh, oh, big time. And satay. This is really one of our biggest sellers. Don't forget kolak pisang. Yes, of course, kolak pisang for dessert. Kolak pisang is like more banana flambe, but 95% is an uh, innocent ingredient, and we're just flaming with uh, uh, banana liquor and then control. So instead of with um, bananas foster, it would be brown sugar, and it would be rum, I guess. With this, it's palm sugar. And oh, pandan, pandan leaf, amazing. Blue pine. Yeah, really amazing. Vanilla, malty, kind of elusive flavor where you just really can't put your finger on what the heck is that. Let's see, we've got a couple more. Um, are there Indonesian, um, Indonesian dishes with Dutch influences being a colony for such a long time? Okay, so this is kind of the reverse. The Dutch adopted the Indonesian cuisine and named it Ristafel, but is there the opposite, I think is the question. Are there more traditional Dutch? And Yona, having worked for Holland America, I know they're just gonna say hodgepodge. Is that hodgepodge? <laughs> exactly what it is. But when you were growing up, were there was there any Dutch? Well, because at the time we 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 hate them. Well, and you know, well, well, because you know, you just you fought a long time for yeah, your independence. Independence. So, uh, in this um, family, they have a lot of influence from the Dutch, but really is until today we still have a, a couple dishes that you know, spoke. Uh, no, let me put the thing ball. Oh, like bitter ball and bitter ball and yeah, you know, something like that. We still have uh, influence, but again, because we have so much uh, Indian uh, cuisine from different island, it's just so much. But again, yes, definitely have uh, that have, have influence in our cuisine. Um, oh. There sure are. Are there any pork dishes being a Muslim country? So that's where Bali would come in. Yes, uh, because it, you're right. The Indonesian is uh, the biggest Muslim country in the world. But in Bali, 90% uh, is Hindu or Buddha. 
also in uh, South Manado, North Manado, or East, East uh, Indonesia, a lot of them are Christian. So people have a lot of uh, uh, pork. But in Java, Sumatra, probably like probably 75, 80% is a Muslim. Um, well, uh, this is a surprising one. <laughs> I love Indonesian desserts. Are they mostly made with coconut milk? My husband doesn't like the smell though. Can you substitute coconut milk with something else? Well, your husband may be the first person that I've run across that doesn't like the smell of coconut milk. Um, but I'm trying to think. So for the bananas foster, use a cream, uh, AKA cream. Kolak Pisan. Yeah, I mean, you could definitely use a little bit of cream. Um, mm -hmm. And I, I would even try, you know, I don't know how he feels about like cashew milk or, um, you know, oat milk or any of those things, but just something to give it a little creamier thing. The important thing is if you can get your hands on the pandan leaf and the gula jawa, which is palm the palm sugar. sugar. Um, and then the, the, you know, there's a little bit of butter in it, but even that can be subject. But I think if you, you know, if you try this, our recipe, you cannot uh, taste uh, coconut so much because we are blending of the, the, the ingredient. I guarantee you, you're going to be like it because it's really kind of more uh, uh, flavor a little bit. Um, this, this question, kick your shoes off get a little beverage, sit back, because someone just asked, and there is no short story, could Chef Yano tell us his story of becoming and being a chef? Well, how many hours do you have? <laughs> <laughs> well, when I graduated from college in the hotel uh, school, and I got a job on the cruise line, all of them were cruise, I stayed there for seven years, and then I met my wife, and then we got married, and we decided in Albany, 1978. And since then, I always in the front of the house. So server, sommelier, front, you know, front of the house. Dining room manager, and not, so on and so on. Cooking. Until 1983, we have opportunity to, to buy a restaurant where I work. And I'm still not a chef. Uh, until one day, one of my chef uh, threatened me to quit if you don't give me a raise. Since then, the next day, I'm in the kitchen, even though I don't know how to boil water. But I believe in me, I can learn it quick. But since then, I buy every single cookbook available. I join every organization regardless uh, uh, profession as a chef, uh, gastronome, restaurant tour, and so on and so on. So every month I go travel to learn from my colleague, networking, and by 10 years that, 1988, probably I'm the first Indian chef to be certified by uh, American Confederation as a certified executive chef. Uh, they shall say, it. if I can do it, everybody can do it. So just need to uh, uh, work hard, dream big. This is my suggestion yeah, in and, my experience. And back, um, if you can harken back, if there's anybody old enough to do that, uh, like we are relics, back to, let's see, 1983. In Albany, New York, um, and I think pretty much the United States of America was not a hotbed of fabulous cuisine. So in Albany, there was a steakhouse with prime rib. There were a lot of Italian restaurants, but the red red sauce Italian restaurants, and um, you know a, a, a couple of Chinese restaurants. There was not there was nothing really cutting edge. So the restaurant that he had worked in that we took over was very traditional and it was an upscale, beautiful, lovely, it had been a governor's mansion. So he inherited a lot of dishes, but right off the bat, he introduced, especially the bakmi goreng and the satay, 
and he can talk a little bit about how that was received. Yeah, when we started up, we were just sate, babi goreng, nasi goreng, and rendang, and gado-gado. But after one, we introduced it, American people began getting uh, more, asking more. This why I say, I like the American palate is always looking for more experience or more dishes from all over the all over the world. When I came to this country, 1978, in our area, probably only three or four restaurants that, you know, like Italian spaghetti meatball, Chinese chicken lo mein, and then steak and potato. And a few restaurants here that, I don't think any Thailand yet at that time, but today we have more than 75 different ethnic uh, restaurants in our city, small city. Um, right there, I had another thought. Uh, well, well, we'll move on to, um, Yono does really enjoy um, being what we've termed to call a culinary ambassador um, and sharing his knowledge and he where pretty much wherever there is an Indonesian embassy or Indonesian consulate, it, he's asked to, um, you know, go and prepare food to do demos. And he really, um, he really does enjoy that. Um, I, I have another, <laughs> do you both like the same dishes and flavors? That's a yes. The only difference is the level of heat. Yes, I think I like uh, more hot. I mean, but again, after you've been eating hot food all the time, so when it's not hot, it seems to me like a blend. <laughs> but what I found, and this was in particular, he made a, a curry. It, it was just at home. It was nothing having to do with the restaurant at home. It was really, really, it was so good. It was so good that, you know, I took a little spoonful and I'm like, oh man, this is really hot. But it was so delicious that I had to keep going back to it. And at the ripe old age, I found out that you can kind of acclimate, like the first three spoons are really hot and they burn your mouth. But if, if you keep going through, you can definitely push through it. Um, what is the number one advice for someone who wants to start a restaurant, especially now during COVID? Okay, we're gonna have two different answers there. All right. Well, for Good me, cop, bad cop. number one, you have to study uh, actually what kind of restaurant you're going to do, uh, what kind of product you're going to sell. Try to get the market, uh, what the people around you like to do. Searching is very important. Number two, get the uh, place that real uh, location and location and location. But sometimes for me, location is not not necessary for me because when I create some Indonesian food, the first one, our location is not really, uh, second one is not really great, but again, we become destination. So we have to have niche. It's different than anybody else. And number two, always keep uh, maintain the quality and standard and flavor. Number three, never cheating the customer. Uh, number four, you got to involve with community. With the community, become your customer and become your friend. So it's really sharing knowledge and uh, uh, be in the board of the charity or school to me, always better because I'm the person that never say no if somebody asking me to do something about whatever. Yeah, and our, our thing is, you know, we, we may not have the money to donate to an organization, but we've raised a ton of money for not-for-profits because if we're raffling off, uh, you know, they're doing a silent auction or a live auction where Chef Yona will come into your home, this is where people, you know, are bidding four or $5,000 for a dinner for six or eight in their home. So though you may not have the money, but you have the time and talent that you're willing to share, that has been a win-win. And, you know, if you have nothing to do on the uh, tomorrow or Monday, if you Google 
Chef Yono or you Google Yono's, you will just see page after page of um, the community involvement. And he loves it. He loves, 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 loves being with people. I have a couple of things to say about the restaurant. Number one, don't buy a business. Find a turnkey operation where someone's been out of business and the owner of the building, if it wasn't the person who was operating, wants to lease it, go in there, clean it up, make it your own. Because even if you buy a successful business, it's not going to be the same. You're paying for something that you may never get a return on investment. You know, if, if we decide, okay, we're done with Yono's and somebody buys Yono's, I, I don't think it's really going to work that well. Um, you should, <laughs> when you're outfitting your space, have twice as much electricity put in that you think you're going to need. I have learned that by experience. Um, if you don't have any other than eating or cooking at home, if you don't have any experience in the restaurant business, definitely go out there and talk to some chefs, tell them you'd like to stage, you want to spend some time, get a job in a restaurant and see what it's like. The hours are grueling. Um, you really need to be there all the time. You're lucky. Let's say you have 30 employees. If you have 10 that you wish you had 10 more of, that is definitely a blessing. And then a big one, if you want to open a restaurant because you think it's going to be a party, yeah, just don't do it. It's your money um, a different way. Uh, most enjoyable dish to make? For me? Ooh, fried rice, because it's so easy. <laughs> and, and in Indonesia, that's a morning, noon, that's a like... Sometimes I make up one fried rice for two days. <laughs> I lunch for dinner. And for breakfast. I'm kind of hungry myself right now. Um, many dishes were modified to local customers' tastes when they were introduced to the U.S. Have you, Chef, kept the original? Oh, yeah. The flavors? You talk about that. Yeah. Well, I think depend. okay? We're not going to make peanut sauce with peanut butter, don't you? For me, if I have to cook for you, your palate is, it doesn't have to hot. I just turn it up. But so just really, the samba. Yeah. So it's really, I use the authentic bumbu, or the authentic ingredient, but just uh, uh, the spaciousness and, and saltiness, we have to adjust it with the, where the people live. Because I cook for them, not cook for myself. So you have to make sure people that you cook is uh, enjoying it and come back and over and over again. As I say, we still have uh, good clientele for after about 43 years, 40, 40, 40, 40 years, people still coming back because we have maintained that uh, established about the quality, the flavor and surface. Yeah. That's my suggestion. And it's, you know, the, the, the whole what works, what doesn't work, you don't know. It's kind of a crapshoot, but I think that being involved in the community things and being very welcoming, being there in your own business. Um, during COVID, uh, was a Saturday in April. People still hadn't gone out yet. It was just a really, really rough time. There were no restaurants open, only to go. And we did what we now term Bach Me Fest, where we did an online thing where people could order. It was just Bach Me. It was for four. You could get vegetarian, you could do it with chicken, you could do it with lobster. And we had no idea what was going to happen, but it became very apparent that it was a happening. And uh, the gridlock surrounding our restaurant was amazing. Um, we call it Bach Me Palooza. Yeah, it, it, was definitely, <laughs> it was definitely a Bach Me Palooza. So, you know, if you have a couple of dishes that are unique to what, you know, and it, it's, of course, not going to be Indonesia. Maybe it is, but wherever you're from, you cook what you know, you cook what you love, and, uh, you know, be kind with the community, and people, they'll, they'll love you, and the way that they love you back is to come to your restaurant. Even now, since we've reopened, um, you see the same people over and over again. Uh, on the whole, I don't think that guest confidence is where it, you know, where we wish it was, but we respect how other people feel. Um, but we are seeing a lot of people saying, hey, this is the first time we've been out. This was going to be our first stop. So um, 
uh, when times get tough in the restaurant game, what keeps you two going? How do you tap into joy when it's such a tough job? For me, with the grandchildren, thank God, we have three grandchildren who live about seven minutes away. But in the meantime, you know, well, you know, in, in marriage, they always have up and down. I was just, shut up. <laughs> <laughs> I'll listen to what she said. Just to keep me, you know, fighting because I don't like fighting. <laughs> because you always lose. Men always lose when you fight with a woman. This matter. True that. <laughs> Save your energy. Um, and he, he does golf every now and then. Um, and he really enjoys that. His golfing is a little different than most people's. You know, he goes with his friends and he's packing up bagels and salmon and all of that kind of stuff and a bottle of champagne not so much competitive. Um, for me, and it, it's really been a squelch on that, I'm, um, I have a music and theater background, so I would like to get on the train and go to New York, which is like a two hour and 25 minute ride, on a Tuesday or Wednesday, see a couple of shows, come back a little bit refreshed. So now I don't have that outlet and I have no idea when um, I will. And the grandkids come in again, because three girls, seven, six, and three, and they are a fabulous audience. There's a lot of dancing, a lot of singing, a lot of tutus, and I'm trying to convince them to be Rockettes, and they said, okay, Glammy, as long as you can be a Rockette with us. So uh, that could be the deal breaker. All right, what else do we have? That's it, terrific. Um, okay. Uh, we, you can connect with us and I'm going to, I'm going to monitor this. Um, my email address is Donna, D-O-N-N-A, Pernomo, P is in Peter, U-R-N, like Nancy, O-M, like Mary, at Yonos, Y-O-N-O-S dot com. And, you know, even if it's the recipes or you have another yearning question, I will make sure that Chef gets those because he and technology, not BFFs. Not the good. And sweating <laughs> through this whole thing. Um, but I will make sure that we get to all of those. And then, you know, please check out if... What you didn't see today was what the jewel box that Yonos is. If you go to yonos.com, um, you can see the dining room. And there's, I believe there's a couple of links. You can see uh, an eight course tasting, you know, kind of in a time lapse. And again, the food that Yono plated it up tonight, if you were to have that same food in Indonesia, it would taste the same, but it would be a different cut of meat. They would not be using rack of lamb. It would be a different cut and exactly what someone asked about, can it be done in a slow cooker? It would be more of that home style. Sure. Um, and then in one location, we have another dining room. It is um, more of an upscale casual called DP Brasserie. And if you look at yonos.com, you can kind of hop back and forth and see, you can check out the menus. And uh, there's probably some links to reach us that way as well, you know, info at, but I would use our, um, I'd use the Donna Pernomo at yonos.com to get a quicker response. So, and let's see, am I saying, oh, 859, God help us all. Hey, have a great weekend. Um, I hope the NCLF conference has been a lot of fun. And last word, this and time, this time, last word. Thank you again for watching and enjoy for the rest of the convention. Good night. <laughs>